Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today's Meeting of the Minds webinar. We are going to talk about today if online shopping creates urban congestion. During each webinar, we take a reading on who's joined us. So you'll see a poll pop up now asking which sector best defines you. Take a second and answer the poll so we know who's joining us um, on the webinar today. My name is Jesse feller Hahn, and I'm the Executive Director of Meaning of the Minds. Some of you are new and some of you uh, are very familiar with Meaning of the Minds, but just a little recap, we are a global thought leadership network and platform for knowledge sharing with year-round digital and in-person programming. We connect global urban sustainability, innovation, and technology leaders across sectors to share best practices, tools, and solutions through our blog, our monthly webinar series, and more than 20 in-person events each year in North America. Some events coming up that you might want to join us for. Our next event's in Cleveland on May 23rd, which is focused on mobility data and equity, specifically as it relates to the Cleveland, Akron, Columbus region, where there's a lot of activity in this space. And next on our calendar is our Ann Arbor Mobility Summit, which convenes on June 14th in Ann Arbor. There we will be gathering about 110 global thought leaders to discuss the future impacts of autonomous mobility on cities, as well as visiting the newly opened American Center for Mobility for a site visit and live demos from automakers and mobility startups. Hoping you guys can all join us for that as well. Our largest event of the year is our 12th annual Fall Leadership Summit, which convenes in Sacramento, California from November 27 to 29. Scholarships are available for public sector leaders, nonprofit executives, entrepreneurs, and academics to attend all of our events throughout the year. You can find more information about our scholarships in the footer of our homepage on the website. And information about all of our events, of course, is available at meaningtheminds.org. A couple housekeeping notes to begin. Because of our very large audience and attendance today, you will remain muted throughout the event. Today's slides and a recording of today's webinar will be available on our website after the event on the event, event page for this webinar for you to share with colleagues that couldn't make it today. We have actually the slides for today from Dr. Allison Conway and Michael Brown already available as, as a PDF in the handout section at the bottom of your screen in the control panel already, so you can, you can see them there. And we will have a Q&A during the second half of the hour. When you have a question, please type them into the questions panel in your attendee control panel as you think of them. So we can see a pop-up of our quick poll, which is 30% 30 per, 30 private sector entrepreneur, 21% public sector, 16% nonprofit sector, 33% academia. Really interesting. Thanks, everyone, for filling that out. That'll help um, contextualize who, who we have with us today for the presenters. So last, I'm really pleased to introduce our two presenters today. Dr. Allison Conway is an associate professor in the Department of Civil Engineering at the City College of New York and the associate director for education at the Region 2 University Transportation Research Center. She's also a member of the research team for Metro Freight, which is a Volvo Research and Education Foundation Center of Excellence in Urban Freight. Her recent her recent research focus has been in the areas of sustainable urban logistics and interactions between freight, passengers, and non-motorized modes in livable communities. Our second presenter today is Michael Brown, who was appointed professor at the University of Gothenburg in Sweden in 2015. His main research focus is on urban goods transport, and he provides academic leadership in the urban freight platform, a University of Gothenburg and Chalmers initiative supported by the Volvo Research and Education Foundations. He's also a member of the VREF Center of Excellence for Sustainable Urban Freight Systems led by Rensselaer. So we are first going to have uh, Michael start us off. So Michael, take it away. Okay, thank you very much, Jesse, and it's uh, really nice to take part in this and to be speaking together with Alison Conway as part of the network uh, that's come together really as a result of this uh, support from the Volvo Research and Education Foundation. And I think this is a great topic to be talking about uh, because there's just so much change happening at the moment here that anybody who's really uh, concerned with urban freight needs to be sort of thinking about this. And it's not just an urban freight question because the interaction, of, uh, the interaction of all the different uh, things that are happening in this area are sort of very important in terms of uh, making us uh, really reshaping the way that the urban system will work. And I think a lot of this is fairly uh, 
Some of it's been around a while, but a lot of it is changing very quickly. And I think that's putting a lot of pressure on sharing information and working together to try and see if there are some solutions to some of the challenges that, uh, that come out as a result of this. And I hope that the webinar today, we can sort of raise some of those issues, show what some people are doing, and also in taking part in the discussion about it, uh, create sort of a, a kind of a platform where we can think about some of the changes. I think all of you who have come into the webinar today, you're, you're really familiar with this whole pressure on cities as a result of the urbanization, the desire for denser, denser patterns in cities, uh, the way things are changing quickly, but they're not changing in the same way in all cities. And that makes standards, it makes uh, identifying what's really best practice or what's even good practice sometimes quite difficult. And we know that in cities, uh, as part of this system, there are many flows. And the flow of uh, goods or the flow of products, that's a flow created obviously by demand and supply. And then that flow has to be accommodated in a set of another flow, a flow of vehicles in some way, usually. And all of that takes place in a very constrained space environment, typically. And a lot of things that happen in cities happen at the same time. So we have a very condensed pattern in terms of the use of the peak periods for personal travel for, uh, and for freight movement. And this squeezing in terms of time means we really need to focus on organization questions. And alongside that, we have this big, big change in the way that people and individuals and organizations are purchasing products and are thinking about the whole importance of, uh, of e-commerce and the, the need to really rethink how we envisage the flows in the urban area in cities. Now, to give some sort of context to this, uh, in terms of the sort of growth rate, it's been very rapid. They estimated at sort of something like 20% a year over the past 10 years. But this growth is very mixed, some even much more dramatic growth patterns than that, and in other cases, uh, less than that. And there are big variations in the importance of uh, retail sales by e-commerce worldwide, overall estimated at about 9%. But this hides the variations between uh, places which have upwards of 20% and others which have much lower growth rates than that. But I guess the fundamental thing is that it's expected to continue to grow significantly and this growth and this variation are going to put pressure on finding solutions to this because the growth in e-commerce is not just about the growth in freight transport, it's also driving change in the spatial planning requirements for cities and it's connected with, uh, with the personal mobility, with the personal travel patterns, as people stop going to the same kind of retail locations they used to go to, the shopping malls perhaps, sometimes city center high streets. As they stop doing that, they change their patterns, and these patterns which are changing quite quickly need to be thought about and addressed uh, in some way. And it's not just about the macro level of this, it's also when we come down to think about the products concerned. And this is just as an example of that coming from an economist special report last year. And it shows clearly that it's not, e-commerce is a phenomenon, but it's not, e-commerce isn't just one phenomenon, it's many different types of products flowing in the system. And each of those has logistics requirements, each of those has different origins and destinations, and each of those creates a different kind of urban freight challenge in terms of thinking about how to accommodate it into the fabric of the city as it stands now and into the way that we can plan for it in the next 5, 10 or 15 years. If we think about those products, we can differentiate some of them and say there are some big change, big, um, big um, differences between them and perhaps one of the fundamental ones is about food products and non-food so in food uh, e-commerce where that started to grow we can see that the average order size or basket size is often quite significant the complexity of putting that basket together can be quite uh, high we can have upwards of 80 different product categories there we may need temperature control we need to think about repeat orders we need to think about the vehicles used and the time of day. And so food and non-food products tend to have quite a different uh, flow pattern and a different way to manage that. And yet, even within food, we see really significant differences between, say, grocery shopping and the ordering of takeaway food or the ordering of uh, food to de delivered to the home. And some of these challenges 
uh, in dealing with that variety will come out in Alison's presentation when she looks in some depth at a case study. Not just about the product, it's also about the place. So the home, the workplace, collection points and lockers. And again, the variety in the systems that are emerging, time definite deliveries, same day deliveries, and what could be called instant deliveries, deliveries within perhaps one hour. Now, many of you will be familiar with this graph, which shows uh, plots in different ways, the connection between urban density and transport energy use for people. And indeed, you know, density is one of the goals uh, in some cases about the planning that's, uh, that we see in cities and the way that we see this developing. But interestingly, if we think about denser cities and we think about the change in, tra in behavior of people as they move perhaps into a different way of life in a city, we have to also see the connection to freight transport, because if we successfully reduce car ownership and use, what will that mean in terms of urban freight transport needs? And if we have the same pattern of uh, purchasing and the same needs for products in the future, then a reduction in car travel could be, in a sense, could help to offset some of the increase in the urban freight transport. Now, we're at a very early stage of these kind of trade-offs being made, despite the increase in the in e-commerce, but understanding the way that freight and personal mobility interact is something which uh, is really important that we focus on. And we need to do that by working much more together between the people who are concerned about personal mobility and the people who are concerned about freight transport. In cities at the moment, in the morning peak, it's not unusual to find that 30% of the traffic flow is actually some kind of freight trip whether that's in a truck or a much smaller vehicle, a van, or perhaps even a very small vehicle like a cargo cycle. But freight's a significant part of the network. And if e-commerce continues to grow like this, it will become a more significant part of the total pattern uh, within the city. So there are issues to consider here. Some of them are about the shading between business to business and business to consumer. For instance, surveys that have been done in London show that uh, perhaps up to 50% of the packages coming into some office mail rooms or post rooms are actually for the personal orders that are being delivered to a convenient location because instead of having it delivered to your home when you're out and then having to arrange for it to be re-delivered, people ask for it to be delivered to their workplace. Now these were not designed for this and it causes kind of questions around whether this is a good way to do things because it avoids failed deliveries, or is it bad because of security questions, bad because there's not the capacity there, bad because the offices are in a city central area. So blurred lines between business to business and business to consumer. I mentioned buildings just now, but clearly residential and commercial property in many cases was not designed for this. Office buildings sometimes have up beyond 200 deliveries a day now and many of them were not originally cons uh, thought about as being uh, likely to have that kind of volume of deliveries happening there. And Alison will talk in detail about residential property. These activities may be in the peak or maybe on the shoulder of the peak, or sometimes they are away from the peak. So that's a question we have to sort of think about addressing. And we know that there are lots of variety in this question. And increasingly we see people using small vehicles to make these kind of deliveries. And this has given rise to a lot of discussion about employment and work conditions and safety and regulation. And I think this fragmentation in the last mile of the chain is a big challenge. If we switch more to e-commerce, perhaps we can accommodate that. But if we switch more to e-commerce and instant delivery, perhaps that will raise a lot of questions about how we can use the space. And one of the big pressures will be pressure on curb space. Just to illustrate that before I hand over to Alison, uh, here's just an analysis that colleagues in uh, London in a project called Freight Traffic Control 2050, uh, colleagues working in uh, University of Westminster, University of Southampton, uh, University College London have been working on. They've been looking at a lot of parcel delivery rounds in central London. And they find that in many, many of these vehicles uh, have a, a complicated operating pattern, very short distances between each of the stops and at the stops, parking sometimes for loading and unloading, usually for, for unloading, obviously, to make the delivery, parking for quite some time, maybe up to eight minutes in, some, in many cases, maybe beyond that. 95% of those stops take place at the curbside. There is no private space to accommodate these vehicles in many cases. 
And so the vehicle ends up being stationary for a significant proportion of its time with people walking a long way in order to make this delivery. So we need to think about that in terms of how we design the street space and how we design, if you like, the interface between a vehicle and a person making a delivery and how we really think about this as a system and not just as a package delivery, because this is going to change, it's going to increase at the moment, and there's many different, um, many different viewpoints that need to be accommodated from architects and designers, planners, and the people operating the vehicles and the people in the businesses and us as residents uh, to deal with that. Now, at this point, uh, I'd like to stop and I'd like to hand over to Alison, who's gonna talk you through a, a very interesting case study that she's been involved in uh, about uh, looking at this from a perspective in New York. Thanks. Yep, thanks, Mike. And I'm just pulling up my screen right now. Um, so um, what I'm going to talk about today is really a, a small local scale study that we did that really illustrates a lot of the points that Mike has already made uh, with respect to spatial distribution, vehicle types, time of day, uh, and ultimately the pressures on curb space that they create. Um, uh, before I uh, go into the detail of what we actually did in our study, I did want to point out that one of the key challenges we have in studying this issue is in identifying uh, real and adequate data sources to get a handle on the complexity of this problem. Um, whenever there is, we're looking for freight data, there's going to be multiple stakeholders who are involved in that movement. Uh, for residential deliveries, that might include the uh, individuals who live and order goods that are delivered. Uh, possibly there's building management that controls what happens within the building or when and how deliveries arrive. Then you have the carrier who's actually carrying those goods. Um, each of these stakeholders can provide part of the data that we need to really understand the, the full detail of what these deliveries are and when and why and how they're moving. Um, but really, none of those stakeholders can identify all of the pieces. So what we used in this case study was um, field observation, which was the sort of brute force method of trying to identify as many of these complex variables as we could, because uh, it required essentially students and researchers standing at the curbside observing every vehicle and every package that arrived at eight residential buildings in New York City. Um, we were only able to cover a, a small number of buildings. So this is a relatively small data set that we had it does include eight buildings from four boroughs in New York City, including the Bronx, Brooklyn, Manhattan, and Queens. Um, all of the buildings we observed were relatively large. So you can see in the table at the bottom of the screen that they ranged from 184 residential units all the way up to close to or 500 units. Um, this data was collected in November and December of 2016 between the hours of 9 a.m. and 9 p.m. That's important to point out just because this is the peak delivery period, but the data is from 2016. Um, what we observed were 295 total vehicle trips. Um, of these, about almost exactly half were prepared meal deliveries. The other half of the deliveries were all other types of goods, which included uh, things like groceries, packaged meals, um, parcels, and things like cleaning and floral deliveries, uh, anything else that you might expect to arrive at a residential building. Um, within these 295 deliveries, we observed 1,240 total packages that actually entered the doors of these buildings. Um, while this was a small data set, we were already able to see some, some differences across these buildings and to gain some real understanding of uh, the types and the distributions of these movements. Um, first, in terms of parcels, uh, we normalized across the eight buildings to a 12-hour day based on the field collected data. And you can see that the range of the density of deliveries uh, was considerably different depending on which buildings. Um, in some buildings, essentially, one package was delivered for every 1.3 apartments in the building during that typical 12-hour day. Uh, on the other end, we had uh, much smaller delivery rates where it was essentially one package per six unit. Uh, when we look at vehicle types, um, that difference becomes even more stark. 
um, those packages translate to one trip per seven residential units um, all the way to one trip per 33 units. Now, looking at who actually delivered the parcels, I just wanted to point out a few key findings. Um, as you would expect, the major players in the residential delivery market are UPS, FedEx, and uh, the US Postal Service, um, with the US Postal Service being the largest of these. Um, these carriers accounted for, during our observation period, 72% of the packages that actually entered uh, any residential building, and that includes deliveries of all types. Um, however, they actually only accounted for 40% of the individual, uh, or sorry, 40% of the vehicle trips that were generated in order to deliver those parcels. Um, I should point out that this data was collected before Amazon uh, shifted to managing their own supply chains. We would expect that these shares would actually reduce a little bit, given that Amazon has increased their use of small local carriers uh, to conduct last mile deliveries for some of their goods. Uh, in terms of delivery times and vehicle types, uh, one clear difference between these residential deliveries that we were trying to observe and more traditional commercial deliveries that you would see to a residential or a retail store or to a more commercial location is that these del deliveries occurred all throughout the day. Uh, as Mike mentioned, delivery times really vary depending on the type of goods that are being delivered. Uh, what we found in our data was that groceries typically would arrive either before the workday or at the end of the workday. That's because groceries require some sort of temperature control. So uh, residents prefer that grocery deliveries would occur, uh, occur when they're actually home to receive that delivery. Um, prepared meals, the same thing, appear at times when people would be actually eating. Um, however, parcels uh, peaked in our data set in the afternoon, which is different from traditional commercial deliveries that would, that would peak during the morning period. Um, however, uh, in generalizing, I should note that the peak delivery times did vary considerably across the eight buildings that we observed. Um, the vehicle types also varied heavily by location, and we thought this was one of the most interesting points that we were able to note from this study. If you look at the Bronx and Queens, um, which are the less densely developed of the, the boroughs that we observed uh, these deliveries in, um, you can see that most of the deliveries are still occurring by what you would typically think of as freight vehicles. So mostly single unit trucks, step vans, which a step van would be a typical UPS, FedEx, or USPS vehicle, and cargo vans. However, in the more densely populated boroughs, of Manhattan and Brooklyn, and particularly the neighborhoods where we were, um, we actually saw that a much more significant, significant share of the goods were arriving to the buildings via some smaller mode, whether that be a passenger car by bicycle or by hand cart. I should point out that the hand cart deliveries don't necessarily mean that that's the only vehicle that was used for that delivery. What it means is that they were either arriving by handcart from a local store, or they were arriving by handcart from a vehicle likely parked somewhere else in the neighborhood that we weren't able to directly observe, um, which raises uh, or refers back to Mike's point that already there is uh, some organization among the, the carriers that are actually making these deliveries. They're performing their own distribution from their trucks, which they're, they're parking somewhere in the space. Um, so why does vehicle type matter? We took our data set and looked at the frequency of deliveries by each vehicle type and the number of parcels that were actually carried in that vehicle so that we could estimate essentially for each vehicle type how much curb space was occupied in order to make that delivery. And what you can see on the screen is that the most efficient vehicle is probably the one that we would expect, which is that step van, which again is the typical vehicle being used by the major carriers. Um, what's concerning about these results is that uh, less efficient are the passenger car and the cargo van, which are smaller type delivery vehicles. As we continue down the road of e-commerce and particularly e-commerce where the receiver has a uh, 
specific say in the time and the speed with which a delivery arrives. We're going to likely see more and more goods moving via those smaller modes in smaller shipment sizes, meaning that those deliveries are likely going to be done less efficiently than they are right now using these larger vehicles. Um, so why does this matter? Well, when we think about New York City and particularly in Manhattan, um, most of our deliveries uh, occur at the curbside. Unlike cities like Chicago, uh, New York, essentially all delivery activity ha happens at the curbside. Right now, New York has a, a fairly large uh, share of commercial dedicated parking spaces. Uh, what you can see on this slide is the map of those existing commercial dedicated parking spaces. As you can see from the colors on the map, uh, right now, the most dedicated space for commercial deliveries is right where you would expect it to be uh, in Midtown and Downtown Manhattan, where we have very dense commercial development. Uh, in other parts of the city, what the two areas circled right now show Inwood and other parts of Northern Manhattan and Astoria, Queens. Uh, these are both primarily residential neighborhoods. You can see in these areas, there's very little and in many census tracts, zero supply of commercial dedicated parking. Um, and in areas like the Upper East and Upper West Sides, which are relatively densely populated, uh, a little bit of mixed use on retail corridors. Again, there's very little space dedicated for commercial deliveries. Why is this a problem? Because residential deliveries look very different spatially, as Mike mentioned, than commercial deliveries. The map on the left shows the actual supply of commercial dedicated parking. The map in the center shows where we expect uh, residential delivery to demand to occur. I should point out that these are approximations made based on USPS household survey data, which gave us a uh, estimated number of packages per week arriving to residents based on their income. So we took that data, used US census data to estimate within each census tract how many packages we expect to arrive. And then we used our own field observations to allocate those to specific vehicle types and specific parking durations that would give us a, a curbside demand. Um, if we look at that, where the current parking exists, we can see that uh, there is not actually in all of that area a tremendous amount of demand for residential delivery, which means in those areas, this is probably not going to generate a tremendous problem, at least in the short term. However, when we focus in on areas that have high residential density, but not high commercial density, this is where we start to see a problem emerge. So the example shown on the screen now is the Upper East Side of Manhattan. Uh, you can see in the center map that the demand for residential delivery is very high. There's relatively high income residents living very densely populated. And so there's very high demand for residential deliveries. However, the available parking uh, in the Upper East Side is very limited and primarily only on those major retail, retail corridors on the avenues that run north and south. So the map on the right essentially shows the ratio of the current residential delivery demand to the existing commercial parking. And so you can see from the color scheme that uh, there are a fair number of census tracts in Manhattan where in the Upper East Side where the residential delivery demand currently with a conservative estimate is already higher than the total space available for all commercial parking. That includes all use by commercial deliveries, all service vehicles. Uh, we're already a race at a ratio of greater than one. So what does this mean for actual parking? Um, this last slide that I'm showing you is zooms in on the Upper West Side, which is very similarly situated. Um, the map that you can see on the left shows the land uses in this neighborhood. Uh, the yellow shows purely residential tax lots. The green shows mixed use residential and commercial tax lots. So those are primarily uh, ground floor retail with a couple stories of residential units above that ground floor retail. 
So when we think about the Upper West Side and where the parking is located for commercial vehicles, almost all of the dedicated commercial parking is on the north-south corridors. The example you can see here is Columbus Avenue. On the retail streets that actually cross Columbus Avenue, many of those streets are single lane and the entire curbside is dedicated for resident parking. And so essentially there is nowhere on the side streets where a truck has the ability or very few places on the side streets where the truck has an ability to park. So what ends up happening are the trucks making deliveries to those residents that are now generating a lot of deliveries end up parking on the major retail corridors where there's much higher traffic flow but where there's also multiple lanes so that at least passing events can occur. So that's what you can see in the picture here. So uh, with that, I think based on both my and Mike's presentations, um, hopefully you, you can see that absolutely online shopping does contribute to urban congestion. Um, the good thing is that there are a lot of different strategies that we can take to actually uh, address this issue. So just a few examples of things that can be done um, I'm going to just mention one or two on the regulatory side, and then I'm going to turn it back over to Mike to talk from the perspective of carriers and receivers. Um, so first, just from a regulatory pr pr perspective, um, the first is just to point out that as we think about reimagining our curbsides and redesigning our streets, we need to think about where the delivery activity is going to happen and where necessary distribution activity might happen. The graphic that was shown on the last slide uh, is Columbus Avenue, where we've put in a parking, a parking protected dedicated bike lane. Um, when a parking protected bike lane comes in, uh, there are several what used to be curbside parking spaces that no longer exist. Um, that's not necessarily from a global perspective a bad thing, but that did reduce the availability of parking to commercial vehicles that would be making a delivery. So that, that has to be part of the discussion. Um, the second, again, shown by the maps, is that we need to think about the time appropriate parking regulations. Um, right now, our data shows that residential deliveries actually peak during the afternoon period where there's act when there is actually less available parking than during morning periods because the parking regulations that we've put in place were done uh, basically designing the streets for commercial deliveries and not for these new emerging residential deliveries. The last major change that's probably needed from a regulatory perspective, and this is not unique to New York, but it is a, a major challenge in New York and in many other US cities, is that like many other US cities, New York has not updated its zoning regulations in more than 50 years, which means that those large residential buildings that are now generating demand for parcels as high as you know 1,000 or 2,000 parcels a day that are coming through the front door, there is nothing in our zoning regulations that mandate that uh, there be an off street loading dock for those deliveries or that even space within the building be required, uh, uh, given for those deliveries or that freight elevators be required in those buildings. So those regulations really need to be revisited with uh, current demands in mind. Uh, so with that, I'm gonna turn it back over to Mike. Okay. Uh, thanks a lot, Alison. And I think it's a great example of how at the moment we're, as researchers, we're piecing together some of these pictures and this information from surveys and from working together with uh, with different kinds of uh, actors in the whole network. And th that's what we need to do at the moment because there's just no data sets out there which give you an instant snapshot of what's happening. Now, of course, some of the carri carriers, they know about this and they're working very hard on improving their efficiency. And we think that in terms of what carriers are doing, they have a, a lot of interesting possibilities because they can use technology to improve some of their efficiency in terms of routing and planning in that way. They can also use their technology and their skills that they have to think about uh, ways to uh, share capacity where appropriate uh, and where that's useful. And also about how to help drivers uh, in terms of finding spaces to park, even though it's already very uh, busy, and also about finding uh, the best ways around the system. And it's quite important to think about the driver in this whole thing because some of the work that uh, has been done in uh, in London showed that actually the less experienced drivers uh, were much less efficient in terms of their deliveries. And as we see an increase in demand for uh, this kind of service, we'll see more and more people having to become into the sector perhaps before autonomous vehicles uh, become widespread. And this will be something that we need to address.
But the receivers play a very big part in it. And that could be businesses like office buildings. It could be businesses like a small commercial uh, organizations could be also retailers as well. The receiver plays a big part in shaping the nature of what gets there. And we, when we're individuals ordering on e-commerce, we're receivers too. Uh, in that sense. So residential buildings are a part of this whole network. And we need to think very hard about the way receivers behave about the delivery time requirements that they, they place on the system. Because having very tight delivery time windows drives up the number of uh, delivery trips that have to be made typically. We also need to think about the connection between these uh, eventual outcome of a delivery and the way people buy or purchase and that could be a business or could be an individual, particularly in terms of uh, common purchasing for, for uh, organizations. And we need to think about the concierge services that could be operating in large buildings and about the scope to retime and something about the location for some of these deliveries. Let's just, uh, if I can just illustrate that by going to the next slide uh, here. Alison, could you click to the next slide perhaps? Thanks. So here's an example, uh, which was a, a sort of good case study because it's, a set, it's one building for multi-tenanted office building, but it's divided into two blocks. One block used uh, a system based much more about sharing procurement services. One block didn't do that. Both blocks were multi-tenanted. And that's quite important because the block which managed to consolidate its order processing, they had about 50% fewer vehicle trips. And each of those vehicles was able to deliver faster uh, in that block than in the second uh, sort of parallel block, which was part of the same building. So it's a clear illustration that organization is critical in this, as well as the question of design and the question of regulation. And maybe, Alison, if you can just go to the next slide. Uh, this was the point I was making about driver experience. We know there are many ways that this could be uh, enhanced and of course the bigger companies are doing that. But I'd point out what Alison noted in her presentation, there are also many, many small organizations who are still part of this network and we need to think about good practices and how those can be shared around in terms of this and about the appropriate application of technology. So maybe if you could just go to the last slide, Alison, I can just uh, close by saying that um, I would like to emphasize that this has been a very quick changing process and the connection to the urban delivery and the urban delivery system is still being, if you like, investigated. And the kind of initiative on small scale surveys uh, and sharing that information, looking at different ways to do things, it's very important that we do that because if we can share this information between the people who need to make decisions and the people who need to change some of the way that they operate possibly, then we have the opportunity to make a big difference here but we need to make a di big difference rather quickly because the speed of this development is so rapid. Uh, we'll be addressing that at a conference in Gothenburg in October and uh, Alison will be coming here to tell people in Sweden and from the rest of Europe about some of the experiences from North America. So it's been very nice to take part. I look forward to the questions and answers in a moment. Thank you so much, Michael, Alison. That's fantastic context for our Q&A, which we're gonna begin now. So. Um, if anyone has any questions, you can type them into the questions panel in your control panel on the right of your screen. We already have a few that have come in, and um, we're going to use this time to, to get into the weeds a little bit more. So a few questions that have already come in. Um, Allison, over to you first. How do you think, um, this is from Gollum Morshed, he's asking, um, how do you think this scenario will change and what will it look like once autonomous vehicles have landed in our cities and towns in the future? So, I mean, obviously autonomous vehicles are have the potential to revolutionize this, both in terms of on-ground vehicles and in air. Uh, the use of drones is often discussed. Um, given the sheer density of volume, um, I think there's discussion to be had about whether drones are going to be a, a appropriate solution for moving a lot of these goods. Um, how, but in terms of autonomous vehicles, I think the, the major changes are, are probably not all unique to freight. It's in the potential to use, uh, more efficiently use space to actually conduct distribution. Uh, maybe to ultimately, that will probably ultimately require 
uh, more cooperation between the different stakeholders, as well as possibly the use of modular types of movements where you would have automated trucks carrying some sort of smaller container that would be transferred to another type of small scale automated vehicle. Uh, that's just a few comments. Yeah, and can you say a little bit more about, given the observations you made at the buildings for the study and the case study, um, I mean, clearly autonomous vehicles will have to stop at the curb unless we invent some other <laughs> of new technology. But the delivery inside the building, obviously drones and robots is what everyone is, is considering at this point. But in your observations with your grad students and yourself, do you think that given the design of all the different kinds of urban environments that you've seen, is that something that you guys think is really feasible? Um, I think there's there's certainly going to be applications of it. Again, I'm, I'm hesitant to say that autonomous vehicles are going to completely replace the human element to these deliveries because one of the key concerns that carriers have is in the face-to-face -face interface, and this is maybe not as true for residential deliveries, but as for commercial deliveries, the carriers actually want to have a face-to-face -face connection with the customers who are receiving their goods. Um, so I do think that's a big challenge moving forward, but I think there is an opportunity, especially, uh, I mentioned some of the in-building movements, that, that those are true for residential buildings, they're probably even more true for large commercial buildings, which is that if there can be some sort of automation of how goods move within the building so that they arrive to a central delivery point, that actually has potential to significantly reduce the amount of time spent by a larger vehicle or by a driver at the curbside um, conducting those deliveries. Thanks. Michael, any thoughts on autonomy, autonomy and robotics and the changing nature of technology impacting all this freight? Yeah, I think it's a great question, and I think Alison made some good points. I think one thing I think is that we've really got to take a sort of systems look at it. So, sure, we, we may be able to get some big benefits out of some of the movement part, but if we lose those benefits when it comes to the handling uh, there, I'm, I'm struck with the, the numbers that show that, uh, in fact, most of the time, people driving vehicles around in cities don't do any driving. Most of the time, they walk. And, uh, you know, we've got to think about where we get the efficiencies in something like that. And I think that it's, again, about taking a system, looking at the system and the interface. So I think we need to, we can be optimistic about the implications and the use of autonomous vehicles, but I don't think we should wait until there are lots of autonomous vehicles around to solve the problem, because I think we need to get a much better handle on the problem and start solving some of it now. Great. And I know you both are involved in the VREF freight research group um, I don't know if I'm I'm calling it the the right name, but uh, I assume some of your colleagues are also thinking a lot about less dense uh, urban environments and suburban environments. You know, um, I think a couple questions have come in asking about the density question because a lot, most of the U.S. is not as dense as Manhattan, as we all know. So, Allison, any thoughts about? Um, how have you looked at or considered areas that where most of the items being delivered, cities it, where the case this might be being delivered that would have been purchased using a private car? Because it seems like replacing individual trips to the store might reduce VMT and lessen congestion. But what are kind of the, what's the data coming out of less dense city environments around replacing replacement of trips and congestion and VMT? Yeah, and that's a great question. Um, and obviously, my work is focusing on the kind of hyper dense environment of New York City. Uh, there have been some specific studies that have looked at the trade offs. Um, I know there was a study done at the University of Washington that compared the uh, emissions from delivery of groceries via truck compared to if residents were instead shopping in stores and, and completing their delivery trips. And as you, as you note it, uh, I believe that study actually found a savings in emissions by transporting the goods uh, directly via truck then uh, because it was replacing those those uh, activities. I think this is a really uncertain question uh, that's more complex than just the density issue. There's also a question of, uh, as Mike pointed out at the very beginning, how freight and travel behavior inter interact um, we don't really have a good understanding of whether e-commerce trips are fully replacing a trip to the store. For example, 
uh, sometimes there's a good you want to purchase and you want to go put your hands on it and see what it looks like. So you take a trip to the store and then you find what you want to buy and then you log online to find the best price. In that case, you still made the store trip. And now in addition to the store trip, you're also going to have a freight delivery trip. Um, there's also retail models where you order online, but you pick up in the store. So it's a really complex interaction even more complicated by the fact that if you do get it delivered, you now have free time that you would have used taking that store trip and what do you do in that time? So um, not to avoid the question, but it's a really, really complex question that absolutely is a research priority that we still need a lot of work on. And also a complication around the type of fuel being used for delivery from trucks, right? Um, yes, That's absolutely. a whole other world of question of, diesel versus natural gas versus electric and the electrification of delivery systems. Um, Michael, any thoughts about that question I asked Ellison around lesser dense environments and replacing um, single occupancy vehicles with, with truck or uh, larger deliveries and impacts yeah. on congestion and, and GHGs? Sure. I think it's, um, it's a diff it is a difficult question. Uh, there's, all other things being equal, an efficient freight trip is going to be a very efficient thing to have. And if it replaces a lot of car journeys, that's great. What we've seen, though, is that people who actually live in some of these less denser areas also maybe at work, maybe that you have a household where both people in the household or maybe it's however it's organized as a household, but everybody's out. So delivering to some households is very, very difficult. So instead of having that difficulty, people then say, well, I'll have it delivered to my workplace. So then it does come into a denser area, even though it was actually ordered by someone who lives in a less densely settled area. So I think we have to think about the, as I say, the overall picture in that. And I think the electrification of the fleet is also significant. I mean, that's clearly going to take away some problem, but it doesn't remove the use of the curb space. And um, so that's a sort of a different challenge that we face in terms of we solve the problem which is great, but we're going to be also experience uh, still some of these quite hard to solve problems about how do we enhance and use the curb space in the most appropriate way? And how do we uh, actually make that effective if we're trying to sort of come up with good systems for people? Great. Another question about emissions for you, Allison, and then back over to you, Michael. Um, did you guys do any emissions estimates from the increase of B2B or B2C deliveries in your case study? And if not in your case study, have you seen any of those emissions estimates with this increase of, of deliveries? Um, again, uh, in this particular study, we did not look at emissions. Um, and so as, as I guess was noted in the last question, I think the results of such an analysis would really vary depending on the vehicle types. Um, uh, again, what we saw across our four buildings was that there were very different fleets actually making deliveries to those, those buildings. So um, a large truck that parks in the neighborhood and uses hand carts to make deliveries all day is not going to be generating much emissions because they're essentially just driving a truck in, parking it, and then using human powered modes to conduct those deliveries. Um, while the, the example that Mike gave in his presentation was a vehicle that's parking eight minutes at a time and making multiple deliveries that are four minutes apart. Obviously there's gonna be a, if assuming that's a diesel fueled vehicle, that's gonna be a much higher uh, emissions associated with the starting and stopping and the pro probably circling, looking for parking. And so um, the emissions are a serious issue. They are not something that we were able to quantify in this study. Yeah, Michael, any comments yeah. on emissions? Yes, yeah, just to say that in the, in the study in London, which is done in this uh, project called Freight Traffic Control 2050, they have looked at some of that, but I don't have the numbers precisely. I don't have the numbers here to, to go through them, but uh, they've looked at that a bit. But it's interesting because, uh, in fact, if you, there, these again are two, the forces are a bit, uh, in, not in conflict, but there's, they're not in the same direction. So if we, if the vehicle is, if we have, if we use smaller vehicles, then in fact there's more, it's there's more availability in terms of electric vehicles at the smaller scale than there is at even the, the slightly larger or the medium-sized scale. So it's, on the one hand, we can solve part of one problem, which may be about air quality and emissions, but if we do that at the, 
by putting more and more vehicles on the road will actually create congestion problems, which in turn as an overall level will be damaging from an emissions point of view. So I think we need to take a hard look at which problems we're solving and which techniques actually lead to a, a solution that's really effective for that. But it's clear that emissions are something that cities are increasingly concerned about and linked to questions of health. And I think we can expect to see this becoming a very topical thing as they look at uh, sort of ultra low emission zones and so on. Great. Uh, okay, so a couple, a bunch more questions have come in. Uh, Ma Allison, back over to you. Maybe you could go to the slide where you're making some regulatory recommendations back over to that slide because we have some questions about recommendations and steps that you guys would, would recommend to, to improve things. So a question from Jose Holguin Veras. Um, if you were the person in charge of freight policy and management in a large city, what steps would you take to improve things in the short, let's say in the short term, first part of the question and long-term second part of the question. So Allison, first over to you. Sure, so I mean, I think the first step would be to um, address the zoning regulations. Now that is not gonna solve the problem for buildings that already exist, but it will at least stem growth of the problem for new buildings that are coming up. So if you, if you address the zoning regulations, then you're able to, um, at least when you have a new building to require mandate that that new building be built so that deliveries can occur efficiently rather than uh, occupying additional uh, street space um, because there were no regulations in place. Um, I guess I can expand on multiple options, but I don't know if I should uh, allow Michael to talk first before I go on too long here. Sure, Michael, yeah. quick just, short term yeah, just, and can, back yeah. to Allison. Well, I think um, for, from my perspective, I mean, that we've underestimated the importance of the role of the receiver and we need to find some way to encourage and enhance uh, you know, their engagement with this process. I know that uh, Jose hogwin himself has done a lot of work about the importance, not just of time in the delivery question with the off, off as uh, delivery projects, but also the importance of understanding how receivers can influence the delivery. And I think if we can get the receiver to become engaged in that, whether that's a receiver as a company or whether that's us as individual receivers, uh, we could do a lot very quickly because there are some very basic things people can do to uh, reduce these uh, number of deliveries that are happening by allowing the carriers to consolidate and operate in a more efficient way. And I think some of the constraints we have over delivery times are not uh, I don't necessarily there for a particular purpose. It's because just that's the way things have gone. So I think re, uh, some of the retiming, some of the consolidation and encouraging shared and joint procurement where it's appropriate for companies. These are all things which could be done quite quickly. So Michael, would you suggest, for instance, if someone's making an order on Amazon, I know you can help, you can, there are a lot of options at the very last point in your order where you can consolidate multiple items into one package if you delay the delivery one or two or three days and are you saying that companies need to do a better job of enabling and incentivizing those options because i know amazon for instance has some incentives like you'll get a few dollars towards amazon fresh if you make those choices and also that the the buyers need to make uh be aware that that actually has huge impacts on cities so yeah that, i think that's that, your idea yeah very good point uh, Jesse, thank you. But uh, no, definitely. I mean, I think it's good if the companies can, the companies themselves are thinking about it, that's for certain. And if they can, they understand a lot about their customer and they are in a position to help to tell the customer, tell a customer, tell a receiver about what's the implication of your decision on this physical chain. Uh, it, it's pretty, in I think the chain is invisible a lot of the time. It's not that somebody's deliberately trying to create a lot of congestion or overuse of the curb space. It's just an invisible part of our lives. And so I think making that more, making that clear to people, offering them more options, allowing them to collect from pickup points whenever that's possible. In some countries, that's very, no in some cities, that's very normal. In others, it's not. All of those things can contribute to this because I think it's not one solution. It's not like we can say, okay, all we've got to do is change the way technology is applied by the carriers. It's lots, quite a few different things have to happen more or less simultaneously 
in order to address this because it's a big challenge. Right. Alison, back over to you for more recommendations of short-term or long-term suggestions. Um, sure. So I just wanted to reiterate Mike's point that, um, and your point actually, that there is definitely a big role for both the receivers themselves and for the uh, the shippers to help uh, bring about more efficient options. And you mentioned Amazon. We've seen also some of the local delivery companies, grocery delivery companies, um, offer discounted. Uh, they actually call it green delivery times where they're able to better consolidate the deliveries that are actually occurring to your area and they offer you a discount to incentivize you to do that based on the time that you pick for your delivery. Um, uh, Mike also mentioned the, the use of just alternative strategies, um, having a lot of different options. Again, these are, there are things that receivers can choose to do. So receivers can choose to pick up their package at a pickup point or a locker rather than require it be delivered to their home where there may be a failed delivery. Um, and from the carrier perspective, trying to implement those types of solutions. So Amazon and UPS uh, and FedEx are all testing or have actually full scale implemented those solutions and are constantly looking for more efficient ways of conducting those deliveries. So kind of the good thing about this problem is that efficient operations for the carrier also lead to good outcomes for the, the area in which they serve in terms of both emissions and space consumption and vehicle miles traveled. Great. Um, interesting question from Philip Yang. Hey, Philip, it's been a very long time. He's based in Sao Paulo. He has a great question. Um, he says, I don't see motorcycle deliveries in the charts. This is to you, Allison. Is it forbidden in New York? In Sao Paulo, it is the dominant mode for small parcels and meals. Um, actually, that's an excellent question. Um, my, in New York, there is very little motorcycle activity. We have very, very few motorized uh, two-wheel vehicles on the road. Um, however, last week, there was a change in another regulation, uh, which has been problematic to smaller modes being implemented, which was a ban on, or at least a gray area, on the legality of electrically assisted bicycles operating on the street. Um, both New York City regulations in New York state law uh, were difficult to understand and essentially the, the general consensus was that it was illegal in New York City to operate an electrically assisted vehicle on the road. The New York City Department of Transportation actually made an announcement or the New York City Mayor's Office made an announcement last week that they're going to clarify the regulations so that uh, slow speed like 20 mile an hour uh, electric pedal assist vehicles will be permitted to operate legally on the roads in New York City. And I, I do expect that that will probably uh, help to implement a little bit more of a mode shift to the use of those types of vehicles. Great. And uh, Michael, over to you. I, are, is most of your research European based or are you seeing, anyway, maybe you can address more of the question around motorcycle deliveries around the world because you're, you're based outside the US as well. Yes, I mean, um, motorcycle deliveries were, have, I think, been pretty important in a lot of cities, especially for traditional courier type activities. And then as this sides, as this kind of activity of e-commerce and instant delivery is taken off, clearly they are significant in some cities. I think it's, again, it's one of the complexities of this question that we don't see exactly the same patterns happening in different cities. So uh, here in Swedish cities, there's far lower use of motorbikes than you motorcycles, sorry, than you would see in in London, for instance. Uh, and in London, that's also been changing a bit as they've uh, as people have used some of these electric smaller electric vehicles for for doing that. But I think that's a, one of the questions that each each city and each in sometimes each sector of the delivery system often has a slightly different uh, way of organizing itself and way of dealing with it. And so we need to take that into account when we think about the best way to initiate a change. And that's why actually we're still at the point where we do need more information about that. We need more good data about the patterns and about the way these operations are carried out. And that way we can think better about how to uh, actually change something. Great. So I want to promise our audience that we will continue to address these questions of freight and delivery and curb space and um, all these changes around e-commerce and, and transportation in cities. Um, we 
are going to be continuing to uh, spotlight uh, research from the freight group at, through Volvo Research and Educational Foundation. Um, we, we have a blog post that was just published yesterday interviewing Allison Conway, um, who presented today, um, and more about her work you can check out on our website and read read the interview with her. Our next interview is with Michael, so you can hear more about his research and work, and we'll continue to be spotlighting some of these researchers around the world who are focused on these questions. Um, as Michael said, this is an emerging and dis disruptive and ever-changing space, so um, we'll be doing a lot of um, deep dive into these questions throughout the year. So I want to just um, we unfortunately are at the top of the hour, so we didn't get to everyone's questions. So we will um, continue the conversation, uh, ask a question on um, Allison's blog post at the bottom of her blog post to continue the conversation with her. Um, and a short survey is going to pop up once you close your browser. We greatly appreciate your feedback. We hope to see you at next month's webinar, which is on May 16th, um, which will be on our website soon, as well as on our blog and at one of our many upcoming events around North America. So just wanted to thank so much to uh, Michael and Allison for your time today and, and all the great work you're doing to help us better understand this changing landscape and, and space in cities. Um, fantastic job today. And um, that concludes our session. We'll, hopefully everyone will see you um, on our website at meaningoftheminds.org. And Allison and Michael, thank you so much. Thank you. Yep, thank you.